Welcome, everybody, to the third session of the Maryland Building Energy Performance Standards Electric and Gas Company Reporting Requirements Working Group. My name is Zach Brazola, and I am the Building Decarbonization Section Head here at MDE. We are glad to have you joining us today. Uh, and I want to do a quick round of introductions for anyone that's new. We have Allison from MDE. Allison, could you say hello? Hey there, everybody. Nice to be back with you. Allison Jaden, I'm a Special Projects Manager on the Climate Change Program. Thanks so much for joining us this afternoon. And I wanted to introduce somebody new. John, could you come on? Introduce yourself, please. Sure. Um, my, my name is John Artist. I work in the Compliance Program um, for the Maryland Department of the Environment. We work to ensure that facilities follow the the, uh, the rules, and that will include BEPS um, as it as it rolls out. So we'll, we'll be working to uh, inform people of the requirements and um, make sure that they're complied with. Thanks, John. Uh, we also have some colleagues from the Maryland Public Service Commission here. Ben, Jared, would you say hello, please? Yes. Hi, this is Ben, Senior Commission Advisor. Good to meet y'all. See y'all again. Hey, everyone. Uh, Jared Deluch. I'm a uh, Department of Energy fellow here at the uh, commission, helping our advisory staff. Nice to see you all. And uh, continuing around the horn, we also have some great support from the Energy Star team here. Uh, Katie, I think I saw you on. Could you introduce yourself, please? Uh, hi, sure. I'm Katie Hatcher with EPA's, EPA's Energy Star program. Happy to be here to listen along to the conversation. And uh, we have our support contractor, Andrew Schulte, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everybody. Andrew Schulte uh, of ICF, working in support of Energy Star. Uh, you may remember me as uh, a presenter on the prior two uh, working group calls. Uh, I am here today in more of a listening role, though uh, if any technical questions come up throughout the uh, the discussion or during the Q&A, I will be here to uh, to help address them. Fantastic. Well, thank you all again for joining us and thanks to the great team uh, on our end for being here as well. Let's get right into our agenda. Uh, first, welcome back. Well, we've been doing that. So glad you're here for the third session. We appreciate you coming back each month. Hopefully we're helping to clarify the requirements and work towards rollout. So first I'll dive into a policy update on BEPS. Then I'll go back over some of the requirements for BEPS that we have. We went over this in the first time, but there's been some questions. So I'll provide some clarification and, and go back over a few key points. And then we'll talk about next steps and uh, save some time and questions, and then save some time as well for uh, spreadsheet utilities to do a little Q&A. Yes, and Allison, who just put it in the chat, if you could put your name and, and the utility you're representing in the chat, that would be great. So we released on July 15th a new uh, version, a new draft of the proposed BEPS regulation. Uh, we're withdrawing the December 2023 proposed version and we'll advance a revised version. What's changed between the two different versions? Really, the major change is the removal of site energy use intensity standards or site EUI standards. And then we've made a few little minor adjustments and modifications, things like the agricultural building definition, the manufacturing building definition, the exemption procedure, and clarified some of the exempt public infrastructure property types like uh, water uh, treatment plants as are exempt, and the consumer price index, we kind of put a clarification in there as well. So what stayed the same? Well, really everything else uh, that we've been talking about the reporting requirements, including the reporting of energy use and emissions data to MDE annually starting on June 1st, 2025, and the net direct emission standards. We have, along with this, put out some site EUI guidance that we intend to establish site EUI standards in 2027, and building owners should refer to the site EUI standards proposed in December 2023 for directional guidance as they plan improvements to their buildings. Building owners are advised not to install electric resistance heating equipment without considering how the use of such equipment would influence their site EUI. 
So this is a key piece that we're trying to educate building owners on as well as we move forward. And, and obviously that serves uh, many different interests across the state in trying to efficiently meet our building decarbonization goals. So a little bit more of a review on the timeline, now where we stand today. This whole new draft regulation was uh, kind of precipitated by a F fiscal year 2025 budget bill that required MDE to withdraw the 2023 proposed site energy use intensity standards. So we've now released the that new regulation, taking those out. We intend to propose that this fall and uh, have covered buildings report by June 1st of 2025. Looking forward, in the spring of 2026, we will, uh, the second year of reporting will happen and that will be our baseline year. And we will use that data uh, to conduct studies required by the FY25 budget. And we will conduct those studies and submit reports to the Maryland legislature of covered buildings 2025 calendar year energy use data. We'll use that data and then to do some analysis and then and report. And then we'll intend to reintroduce the site EUI standards and satisfy our Climate Solutions Now Act requirement for a dual standard BEPS. The interim standards still intend to take in effect in January of 2030. And covered buildings would report their 2030 energy use data to demonstrate compliance in the spring of 2031. Before we go back to, I just want to really remind folks of what the reporting requirements are of building owners. And so that we're all kind of, again, on the same page here for where this stands. So starting in 2025, building owners must annually collect previous calendar year whole building energy data for owned covered buildings and submit that to MDE through the Energy Star Portfolio Manager tool by June 1st. That data shall be requested from relevant utilities. So the key clarification here that I want to make for you all is that building owners are the ones that are going to initiate data requests to you all. And the onus is on them to identify themselves as covered buildings. Da that data must then be submitted to MDE, sorted by month and fuel type, and building owners will exclude energy consumption for certain end uses that are exempted. They're gonna use Energy Star Portfolio Manager's data quality checker prior to submission every year, and in certain years have that data verified by a third party. Building owners must retain five years of historical data that starts when the regulation goes into effect and goes forward. And on that now, switching over to the electric and gas company reporting requirements. Again, we've discussed this at our first meeting already, but I wanted to give uh, a little bit more of a refresher here, given some of the questions received and reiterate the points and offer again, some more clarifications. So data retention on electric and gas companies is to maintain whole building energy data for no less than five years. Uh, but again, just like with the building owners, that is starting with 2024 data. So you all uh, must retain 2024, 2025 and forward and five years back you know, again, but starting with that 2024 data. So uh, that's the kind of key. I know there was a lot of questions and confusion around that. We're, we're not asking you to go uh, reach back before 2024. On data provision, that um, electric and gas companies must provide 12 months of whole building energy data to the building owner aggregated on a monthly basis and by fuel type. And that must be on request within 90 days in 2025 and 30 days in 2026 and beyond. That data will be aggregated across meters uh, in for a single building. And if there's more, five or more tenants, there's no authorization needed from those tenants. Uh, the building owner can request it and you all can provide that data. If there is less than five tenants, the building owner must provide written or electronic consent from each tenant, but that can also be in a lease provision. 
in terms of delivering that data for investor owned utilities with greater than 40,000 customers, they must provide that data through the Energy Star Portfolio Manager Web Services API. Investor owned utilities with less than 40,000 customers, cooperatively owned utilities and municipal utilities, you all can provide that data via Energy Star Portfolio Manager's Web Services API, which we think has a lot of benefits for everybody but you can also provide that through a predefined spreadsheet format that we've shared before in uh, before the last meeting or in the last meeting, I believe. Uh, and if there's any questions on that spreadsheet, well, we again, we have a whole uh, section at the end of this dedicated to go into specific questions for the spreadsheet specific utilities. Furthermore, there are requirements around data completeness and accuracy. So for properties with on-site generation of renewable electricity, for example, solar or wind, the consumption values de delivered to the building owner must capture total gross grid electricity consumption as metered by the electric or gas company, rather than net or net metered consumption of grid electricity. And that means that all on-site solar generation needs to get excluded. If it, if it is rolled up in that total. Uh, you know, utilities must develop a process to identify and confirm with building owners the list of meters that will be used to calculate the aggregate total as follows. Provide the building owner a list of all meters included in the whole building energy consumption data for verification purposes. And if any correction or update takes place at a meter that is included in the whole building energy consumption data, then the affected values shall be proactively updated through the benchmarking tools web services API or through an updated spreadsheet template with a notification provided to the billing owner and or data requester. So again, another flag and clarification here, the Energy Star Portfolio Manager web services, it will update automatically when you push that through, but that doesn't necessarily, that does not notify the building owners that there's been a change. It will just roll through. So when that change happens, you must proactively notify the building owners that a change has been promulgated through their data. And uh, so that's the kind of key thing there. And if you have some specific questions on, on these, again, we've got the EPA technical folks on the line, and we can absolutely dive into some of those questions during q and I'm a visual learner, so I want to actually like Put a flow chart on the screen for some of you and help and talk through basically everything I've just said. And I'm just realizing, Allison, could you drop a link to the draft, uh, the new draft released? Thank you. Yeah. So everything that I just said on the last few pages is just literally taken right out of the regulation as it was previously pro proposed in December 2023. And uh, we've re released with those minor changes I first addressed. Uh, but at a high level, a flowchart for data requests. The building owner is going to determine they're covered based on their information about their building, their square footage, and the exemption status. The building owner is going to initiate an energy data request from their utility providing information about their building. And then the utility is going to identify the list of meters for that property and deliver the list of meters to the owner. The building owner is going to confirm the list of meters is accurate for their property. Make sure there's nothing unsurprising in there or that they're not missing something. If there are less than five tenants, the tenants are gonna provide consent for delivery of energy data to the building owner, who then is gonna share that consent with the utility. If there are more than five, five or more tenants in that building, the utility can automatically provide that aggregated monthly data to the building owner via API or spreadsheet. And if there's any data corrections after this, the utility updates that data via API or that spreadsheet. And if it's via the API, it must separately notify the building owner. And with the spreadsheet, uh, intrinsically, you've got to send that to them. So you're notifying when you send that spreadsheet. Keeping on this visual time frame, here's a little bit more of visualization of the dates and the timelines that i just talked about in the requirements so january 1st 2025 is the first day when building owners could request data and for requests on that day they have 90 days which means that data must be delivered by april 1st 2025 and the benchmarking uh, the reporting deadline is june 1st 2025 so that's the latest that building owners can submit to us next year 
and that cycle continues, but with the 30-day window beyond in the following years. So on to our next steps. This is the final group meeting that we've planned for this year. Our next step will be one-to-one -one meetings with the different utilities to provide feedback on the status reports that you've provided us, and also answer any specific questions that might not be suitable for a group setting. So that's kind of the next thing, and we'll be scheduled. I'll be sending out a booking link to everybody soon uh, to schedule those meetings, and you'll just I'll send it to this whole group and find a time that works for your team on our calendar, and we'll have those sessions to to really dive in a little bit. Uh, but if you have broader questions that are would be great, we'll be welcoming them in a few minutes. And then after that meeting, we're requesting that each utility provide an implementation and communication plan with the following information in it, a high level description of the process for building owners to request data. So that flow chart that I just outlined, like what does that process look like for your specific utility and any existing websites or landing pages that building owners could use as part of that process, uh, as well as uh, outline of some methods of communication for how building owners can get information about your data delivery for BEPS. And this could be a phone number, or an email, or a support contractor to, to reach out to. Uh, these are the kind of things we wanna just make sure we have clarity on because we wanna be sure that we have the appropriate channel to refer building owners to when they contact us about accessing this data in the new year. And uh, we also want your input uh, it, it really starting now on uh, if you'd be interested, but also in these one-to-one -one meetings, if you'd be interested in co-hosting or supporting training sessions and webinars for your customers, uh, let us know if and how MDE can be involved late this year or early next year as we really start to dive into uh, data request season. We wanna try to make this smooth for everyone, both building owners and you all uh, to ensure everyone can get the data they need and, and get it to us on time. And as always, uh, feel free to reach out to the Energy Star team with technical questions at statelocal at energystar.gov. And with that, we're into the question portion. Tried to stay a little bit lighter on content this time, uh, but wanna open it up for questions and discussion. And if you have specific questions that you don't wanna ask in this format, feel free to email us at beps.mde at maryland.gov or give us a phone call at 410-537-3183. And I'm assuming everybody's been on our email list already, but if you're not, feel free to scan the QR code on the screen or visit the website. All right, we have a question. Yeah, Michael. I turn my mute off. Uh, if building owners direct questions to the utility, is there going to be a hotline or web page that MD has specifically that the utilities can refer them to? Yeah, so any question about the regulation that is sent to a utility, uh, feel free to share that beps.mde at maryland.gov email. Uh, that'll go directly to us as well as that phone number. Both of those can work if there's questions about the regulation that the utility gets. Great, thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and if there's something too, if you're getting a lot of questions or you want additional resources, feel free to reach out directly to us. We you know, want to ensure that we're, everyone's getting the right information. Yeah, Zach, uh, Jeff Shaw here at SMECO. Um, Question, a couple of questions. When does MDE intend to notify those that are covered? Yes, that's a great question. So um, we intend to notify everyone. Uh, basically, uh, the goal will be to notify them by the start of next year. So that June, January 1st deadline is what we're shooting for. So you're going to notify them January 1. If you wouldn't mind, step back a few slides then to your timeline. All right, they get notified Jan 1. They're going to digest this 
we all know the data requests are going to come to the utility May 31st. They're not going to react and have this ready for you. I'm just being realistic. So then the utility still have 90 days to fulfill those requests beginning the date of their submittals. You can see how this is going to cascade through 25 and probably linger into 26. You, yep, Jeff, you're you're right on. So the part, uh, Allison, you want to say something? Paul, well, I was just going to jump in on, um, you know, understanding and appreciating the challenge that we all have about getting the information out. And we certainly have been working uh, since the Climate Solutions Now Act was passed to build awareness about the requirements coming and the baseline year being 2025. Um, that is why we're working to have that initial data submission, which is not the actual baseline year to be a, a kind of an initial submission, that 2025 submission being that first time we go through this process in advance of that 2026 submission being the baseline submission. Um, so, you know, while we are still working to finalize the regulation and, uh, you know, publish the uh, final covered building list and the final notifications, we certainly have been working in the interim to raise awareness about what is coming. And so the, you know, the team's been working really hard on, uh, you know, bringing that information out there. We're uh, in a, the third week of a information, se you know, information sessions publicly and certainly would uh, benefit from coordination and collaboration across the state and how to raise awareness about what's coming in advance of the regulation being finalized. Okay, thank you. And I mean, we, I think we've mentioned before- You said you had more than one question though. <laughs> Did you have no, the, the first one was the notification date. Yeah. Uh, and, that, and then I stepped back into the timeline to politely and gently lay that out and ask a question inside of that. So. I, I could go on for a while, but I'll I'll back off and let others chime in. <laughs> well, we we welcome uh, any additional questions and uh, appreciate you passing the mic to others. But that is why we want to have this time together to hear questions and, and concerns that you all have. Good afternoon. My name is Tucker Bullock. I'm with Easton Utilities. Um, so kind of a next question to what we were just talking about. MDE plans to notify building owners January 1st. Can you expand upon the communication plan for um, getting the information to those building owners and education on what their your expectations of them are? Yes, absolutely. So basically the goal is you know, in our notification, we will be saying you're covered. And uh, we at that point, and that's why we want to coordinate is to be really trying to help ensure that then they're looking to your landing page website, whatever it is for how they request that data from you. And so, you know, th they'll have some things from us on how to get stood up in an Energy Star Portfolio Manager account, how to get their unique ID for the state, all the kind of more kind of pieces on our end, but we also will be telling them then to go to their utility and request it. And that's why the goal for that kind of implementation and communication plan is just so that we have a resource that we can say, you know, here's your utility, here is the page to go to to put in your data request. Uh, I know some of the utilities already have this, so that's you know, basically just telling us where it is. For some of the smaller folks, maybe it's a person to email, that's fine, right? You know, if you have 10 covered buildings in your service territory, it might just be, we totally understand if it's a email this person with your data, you know, with your building information to get this. So that's what we're trying to do as we communicate is make it really seamless for those building owners to start that data request process. Can Could you uh, specify uh, the manner of which the communication will happen? Will this be a phone call directly to building owners? Will it be mailings or emails? We're going to start with mailings. Um, we are also doing our best to get emails for any uh, anyone we can, but truthfully, that's pretty limited to start. So we're, we're mostly going to be mailing folks. Um, 
and that's something where we're absolutely happy to, to talk with you all if you have good contacts with the building owners in your territory as we have that list we could uh, potentially work together to make sure that they're aware uh, of the requirements yeah that uh, is going to be a challenge because um, you know not all of our customers are building owners and maybe even vice versa. So that, uh, that'll that be a challenge we all uh, struggle through. Next question. Um, so each building is, is issued a uh, unique building identification number. Um, and we have the covered building list you guys published um, originally that does not include the UBIDs. Can, can, are you planning to share that with us so we will have those for the building owners? Yes, absolutely. So that uh, when the regulation is finalized, we'll have that final list with the updated UBIDs. And, uh, but there is uh, already a unique ID in that um, list that we're, we're kind of working now, but the new one will be uh, published with that new list. So that's the kind of one of the biggest changes we're making is that UBIT. So absolutely can share it with this group when it comes out. And I just wanted to maybe put a plug in here some of the specific questions on how to benchmark. We're hosting a benchmarking and reporting working group on September 10th at 1 p.m. And that's a really good time for building owners that want to learn more about the benchmarking process. And, and you all, if you want to learn more as well, uh, feel free to sign up for that. We can put the link in the chat maybe to, si to the sign up sheet for that. Um, but we're really going to start diving into all of the specifics of, of how to benchmark and, and put your data in. So that's kind of, again, as Allison was saying earlier, we're, we're in the midst of a big outreach push right now to get people aware of all the processes. And that's kind of getting into some of the nitty gritty details of, of how to do it all. So uh, going back to um, revising the list, um, is there an opportunity for us to provide feedback to you. So for instance, we've identified about 40 of, you, of the buildings on the 9,000 covered building list that are in our service territory. One of them is scheduled for demolition by the end of this calendar year. Another one is a school. Uh, and then a couple of others we had questions about. If, if we needed to provide feedback to help you uh, narrow down that list, um, what's the best way to do that? Yeah, that I mean, absolutely, we welcome that input. Uh, we're working off the best data we have statewide, so we know that there's situations unique to each building. Um, feel free to give us an email at that beps.mde at maryland.gov with, with any of that information. That'll help us. Uh, we'll definitely take that into account as we go through the next iteration. Okay. Um, going through your um, slideshow, and I, I appreciate um, you guys taking the time to do that. This is the first time I picked up on the <clears throat> less than five tenants uh, record uh, um, uh, consent form, uh, so they'll they'll need to provide consent. Wh who will be responsible for the records retention of those consent forms? So just uh, the kind of thinking here is just like with the energy data. This would be uh, the building owners have to maintain that consent, but we also are. And Allison, correct me if I'm wrong, but we're also thinking that the utilities would keep track of that. Actually, Allison, do you have any thoughts on this one? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a great question that I don't know has been raised quite yet. Um, certainly the building owners would be responsible. Like for example, if it was something that they had in their lease, that that would be something that they have in their own records. Um, but certainly something we can uh, discuss and get back to you with a definitive answer. Appreciate that, yeah. Um, and then last question and I'll uh, let some other folks speak up. Um, is there any discussion about fee in lieu of compliance with this benchmarking reporting? So there is, and maybe what you're picking up on is the alternative compliance payment for the net direct emission standards. So that is uh, for per ton of emissions over compliance payment, but that's the only alternative compliance payment that we're authorized by the legislature to accept. So I, that's the kind of piece. And if that's something you want to learn more about, I can definitely uh, 
talk a little bit about that, but that's that's for compliance with the emission standard. Just submit um, a PSC just to make sure you throw on the call. There is no alternative compliance payments for not providing this data to MD. So this has to happen. There is no alternative, correct? Yes, that is correct. Thank you very much. I, I would, would offer just one slight variation of that. Uh, MDE's lobbyists informed the Chamber of Commerce that they intend to seek legislation on that issue. There's nothing in the law currently about an alternative compliance fee for EUI, but there have been conversations about legislation for next year. But the question and this comment was around alternative compliance payments for submitting reports, correct? Not about the standards themselves. That is correct. So if there's a building owner that cannot comply with, with the this reporting, reporting, uh, what are uh, what are the alternatives, or quite frankly, what would the consequences be? Yes. So, so any, uh, just as uh, John kind of mentioned at the start of the call, that kind of falls into our more general non-compliance, and that would be working with the compliance division uh, at MDE to discuss it. I, I don't know, John, if you had anything sure. else. You yeah. To add. Yeah. Sure. So, I mean, obviously, this is a new role and like it has a lot of moving parts. So, initially, like we're working hard to inform people of the requirements and like work with them to to get the information submitted like ultimately since th this is just data submission like we think people will be able to like submit their electrical usage data in into the system and comp comply with the role so we're, we're going to work really hard to make that happen sure that happens but however if, if there was a situation where like someone just refused to submit the data like it would be handled like any other non-compliance uh process where you you would be informed of the rule, uh, a notice of violation could be issued, and then it, it could proceed down towards uh, civil or administrative penalties. But I, I, I don't expect that to be a, a large per percentage of the of the cases once we work through the, the notification requirements and say, this is what you need to do. Thank you. Tina? Hi, Tina Wytrowski with PE. So I had a question around um, the consent as well, a question and a comment actually. So we do benchmarking in our New Jersey territory and we do also have consent forms because they have a, a rule similar to the five, but it's for four and yada, yada. So ideally we would like to keep our same consent form and repurpose it. The way we do our consent form is it is evergreen meaning the tenant only needs to fill it out one time and the building owner only needs to get a new one if they have a new tenant. So that's what we'd like to continue to do, which we can talk further about when we have our one-on-one. -on -one. My question really is how do we handle or how do you envision us handling the consents that are in a lease? Are we to get a copy of the lease and kind of determine if this is a legal document and if it's consent? Like what what is the utility responsibility for that part? That's a that's a really great really? question, and I think um, and I appreciate your guys's experience in uh, New Jersey, having gone through this process already. I think that's another one we'll definitely want to uh, take back and then give more clarifying information to you all, so that we make sure that we get it right. Thank you. And I will, you know, just Tina to your question about the kind of filling out that consent form once uh, when they're filling out the form, that was our intention um, that it's, you know, it's filled out unless the tenant changes over to try to keep that nice and smooth for everybody. Awesome. Thank you. Yes, Jeff. In the work that we've been doing here, just a comment. Um, it we have uh, assumed it's the landlord's responsibility to get the permissions 
and the landlord's responsibility to, to maintain the validity of those per permissions that were not involved except to get um, a copy of the permission from the landlord. So I just wanted to clarify how we're doing it at BGE and that keeps the utility out of it. It's really not the relationship that we have, the relationships between the landlord and the tenant. Jeff, I think that makes a lot of sense. That's very helpful feedback too. Go ahead, Jeff. Um, since it's quiet, I wanted to bring up another point. Um, I think it's item 5B that requires the utility um, through the um, benchmarking tool to notify the customer when there are changes made in the file, updates to the file changes, things like that. Um, we were thinking that that could become an awful lot of emails to the customer and are proposing that perhaps we put a log in the benchmarking tool so that when the customer logs into the benchmarking tool, it shows all the changes in a log format rather than emailing them every time we update, which is going to be at least once a month, but it's probably going to be more with you know corrections and such. So we we're wondering if that would be an acceptable way to go about notifying the customer. Andrew, do you think you could could talk to this one more on just the feasibility of doing that and, and how that makes sense? Yes, if I can, I, I can find the mute button. Um, that would that would help. So um, feasibility of communicating to partners, are we talking just in general or uh, specifically for a web services based solution versus a spreadsheet based solution? Uh, well, in our case, for web services, and and again, um, there will be updates made all the time. And yeah, um, we, you know, I, I think the intent was for the building owner to be able to see what's been updated. Um, That's right. But, but we don't want to bother them all the time and send them emails all the time. So yeah, we Jeff. Yeah, and I can't, you know, I can't speak to exactly what is, you know, compliant with the law, but just, you know, for speaking speaking in generalities, I mean, it, um, so, you know, you'd have, you'd be looking at an API-based solution, which would mean that, you know, your solution would be expected to push ongoing monthly updates each month, mm -hmm. right? So that yeah. is kind of, that's kind of, that would be expected by your customers who are taking advantage of this service. And so what I would say is, a typical standard edition of the most recent months, uh, sorry, the most recent month's worth of energy consumption is not something you'd have to, in my mind, specifically call out, right? Mm -hmm. That's just expected. And in portfolio manager, when if BGE delivers um, the, the, the data via their system, there's going to be a little note next to that month's energy consumption record that says, you know, last updated by. BGE on such and mm -hmm. such a date, right? right? So for all intents and purposes, I think we can probably agree for that, that for the average user, that is everything uh, operating as, as, as expected. I think mm -hmm. the bigger issue here is what happens in cases, because we know that there are always rebills, cancels and rebills and updates and whatnot. So Correct. the real question here is, what if, you know, you're going to do this month's upload and then you know, there was actually a change to the final billing consumption data from, you know, three or four or five months ago. And mm -hmm. you're thinking, oh, well, we can go just make that update now. The idea here is that if you're updating something in the past, right, right. 
-hmm. the building owner needs to be aware that something has changed and they might not otherwise be aware because they might not be looking for it. So it's kind of that case where you're going back to revise a historical record where we would say, you know, that's when you need to figure out how to make the customer aware so they're not caught off guard because there have been, you know, stories that we've heard from other utilities in other jurisdictions where um, something changed and it was quite a drastic change, you know, in the historical consumption record, you know, such that it actually changed the metrics for them and they had no heads up that this was coming. So it was kind of a shock mm -hmm. to them. So mm -hmm. I think that's what we're talking about here. Um, I think that's the, the the most important case. Right. Okay. And and for that case, would would a notification within the web services? Yeah. Act so on, that's where we. <laughs> well, um, unfortunately, Portfolio Manager at this point in time does not offer push messaging services. It's not a CRM system, right? Yeah. So there really are limited options for sending mm -hmm. notifications to your customer within Portfolio Manager. Um, probably this is the sort of thing where, you know, uh, streamlined rules for email generation, mm -hmm. um, you know, might might be the most direct pathway there. Um, unfortunately, it's you're not going to be able to rely on Portfolio Manager for, you know, populating proactive push messages to your customer's account. Right. But our benchmarking tool could potentially do that. Um, yeah. And, and I understand, you know, the, the benchmarking tool that y'all, y'all have today. Um, I mean, your bench, certainly your benchmarking tool has, you know, a portal, right? Mm -hmm. Like a, fr a, fr a BGE right. front end. Um, so certainly if, if that is a mechanism through which you could push messaging instead of emails, that's, that, that's absolutely, uh, possible. The important thing is that, you you have a process in place to message you know any retrospective changes and also that your customers understand where they would be receiving these notifications and therefore where they should go to check for them okay very good thank you thanks andrew that was very helpful and great great it's helpful when you have the ex the expert the the us wide expert on how this works on the line Ben, I saw your hand raised. Did you have something to chime in on? No, I was going to ask a clarifying question, which Andrew then immediately answered. Um, I guess the question for maybe you, I guess for MDE, like that I'd be curious about is if the utilities set up a system where by default, they're going to get all the notices if there's an update, but the customer can opt out, like they can kind of select their email frequency through, I guess, Andrew just described kind of up there's a front page, like if the utilities are managing a system like that. Is that going to be a problem with your rules so that customers can decide how frequently they want to get pinged about this? I think that's a customer's choice to make that decision if they don't want to get pinged uh, and the utility offers it to be pinged. I think that's fair. Uh, I don't see that being a problem on our end. Okay. We just the main reason I raised it is is that limitation that Andrew mentioned of that you know portfolio manager itself cannot say you've gotten new data because of a rebuild for example and so we just want to make sure that they've requested data it gets in their account and it doesn't they don't know that it's changed and and their numbers change so that's the biggest thing we want to just avoid confusion on all parts and so notifications are are the idea to to try to help smooth that out. Do we have any other questions? This is Tucker Bullock with <clears throat> Eastern Utilities again, follow up from our discussion earlier. Um, do you have a proposed date on when that new covered buildings list will be published? We're working on it, but we're also waiting for the final adoption of the regulation uh, to have that, that uh, the final covered buildings out list out. Okay. Thank you. But I think, um, you know, folks have mentioned and we've mentioned on here before around the Excel spreadsheet that is up online now with the preliminary list. So we really are working on 
you know, updates and modifications and those unique identifiers onto that existing list. So I think, you know, you guys have already described Tucker, you've looked at that list, you've got suggestions for us, um, and we would welcome and appreciate that kind of input. Um, but, you know, that that is a really good starting off point for everybody for what is already available online. But in, until the regulation is final, we are, it is our preliminary, preliminary buildings list. Thank you. I guess the other thing I would add on the covered buildings list is that we will be updating it every year. <laughs> so this is a, we are not just uh, working off of improving the preliminary buildings analysis that's up online, but also developing the process by which we will be updating that list annually. Uh, because Tucker, as you mentioned, buildings are demolished, they get built, things happen. We will be uh, using obviously the information that comes in on those first year submittals and the exception, uh, you know, requests and different types of information we get directly from building owners to that to refine that list over time. So this is really the beginning of a uh, multi-year process rather than just a one and done list. Um, and so we will be, you know, publishing what we call then the final buildings list for the year, but then that will be uh, redone every year as we get new information. And and thanks, Allison. That's a really good point. And also to just to all the other utilities, obviously, Tucker, you've done some detailed analysis. So we'll absolutely take that information to help inform the list. But you know, we have a pr whole process in place and a bunch of forms that we're putting together for demolished buildings, for a building that's on the list that's actually, you know, 25,000 square feet, but we had the wrong data from the statewide database, or it's 35,499, not 35,001 you know, square feet, for example. So we have processes in place for building owners uh, that'll, as part of the kind of total process, uh, be available for them to submit and say, I'm exempted because I'm a, a K-12 school, for example, or any of the other kind of list of things that might exempt you or change your, you know, status on that list. So that's, a, for that reason, that list is going to be constant, you know, it will be updated uh, based on these uh, different forms and everything coming in. So uh, uh, it's definitely not something you have to take on, but uh, always happy for the assistance here to, to streamline it. And especially that's, I think, one of the challenges we'll face is connecting with every single building owner on that list, uh, because we know that the mailing won't always get to them. So uh, do it. we will appreciate your help on that front. Well, with that, I'm going to switch us over to the spreadsheet utilities Q&A, which their agenda really is just open floor again for specific questions on that spreadsheet process, on anything that differs here, or if you want to get more information on you know, why you might consider going with the API instead of a spreadsheet. We're, we've got Andrew here. We've got you know, uh, the kind of folks in the room to help think through this. So I want to just open the floor for that specific area. And obviously, if you think of something else more general, feel free to. But for the utilities that are absolutely definitely required to be in the API category, uh, I'm going to just say uh, thanks for joining us. Um, feel free to email us if you have more questions or some of these specific follow ups. And uh, look out for an email from us shortly with a one to one booking link to do those follow-up meetings. there any uh, 
questions from one of those spreadsheet utilities? This is Jeff here again at Smeco. Uh, I think what you may seen from from us of the cooperatives, but a rather large cooperatives, is to maybe initially be spreadsheet driven, but within a year quickly transition into an API format, uh, busily receiving quotes to see what this cost is here to the utility. And uh, uh, Ben Baker, I see you on the phone. So that the, these will be. Uh, added costs to utility business. Um, so be aware when rate cases come. We know. These aren't coming cheaply. Yeah, same thing as always. Yeah. Figure out what's the most prudent of costs and then we'll be discussing a rate case. Gotcha. Yeah, and, and Jeff, that you know, we we support that transition, obviously, and understand if it you know takes that year to to get it stood up. Um, and as you're making that transition, if there's support that the Energy Star team can provide, uh, they're here to help to help with that. Gotcha, and appreciate that. There might be similar letters involved with our consultant that are on the EPA side of the house for their consultant so if that makes sense are there any other questions i'm happy to give everybody back an hour of their afternoon but i want to give space here before we kind of have this last meeting of everyone in the group or while we have everyone in the group here still. Well, I've given everyone sufficient time to think about it. If you have any specific questions, feel free to email us. We're happy to schedule. We'll schedule those one on ones. But if you have a, a burning question, you can definitely find some time to talk before then as well, if needed. Uh, we really appreciate all your time and your work with us to implement this. Um, we will be in touch pretty soon. Thank you all for joining us today. Have a great one.